Hello everyone. Welcome to On the Journey with Carissa and Friends. I'm your host, Carissa Hardage, and I can't tell you how excited I am to be with you for our very first podcast. This has been something that's been on my heart for such a long time, and God's timing has just not been right for it for me personally to be involved with the podcast. As some of you know, um, my journey of faith is the ministry that I am deeply involved with. My precious mother in law, Sandra Hardage, is the founder of my journey of faith ministries. And it has a variety of different platforms where women can be involved and share their stories and, and serve, um, serve out their calling. And for the podcast, we've had three different hosts in the past for my journey of faith. It was at that point, it was called my journey of faith blog talk radio. And there are still episodes on our website from Cynthia McCutcheons and Jennifer Booth, who currently is her own podcaster, and called, she has a podcast called Live It Out that I highly recommend. And then we also had Vicki Henderson, who's a dear friend of the ministry, who served as our host for a period of time. And they had some amazing interviews that if you haven't had a chance to hear them, I strongly suggest that you hit our website, myjourneyoffaith.com, and go back and listen to some of those, um, just those incredible guests, incredible stories. But my turn has finally come, and I've been praying about this for a couple of years, really, Um I've always been a little envious that Vicki and Jennifer and Cynthia have had the opportunity to host, and I've gotten to fill in a few times as well. Um, when they weren't able to come, I was able to step in and fill in a few times, but my heart is just in talking, well, talking. <laughs> Those of you who know me know I love to talk, but also just talking to women in general. I love Love, love to hear women's stories. I think that they are so fascinating and interesting. And, you know, you always can tell so much more about a person once you really dig into their stories. So I'm built to be a storyteller, but I'm also built to be a story listener, if I can coin that phrase. So this is it. This is the first episode, and I'm so excited for God to give me the opportunity to host Um, our new podcast. And so the name has changed a little bit. You may notice that um, it has a bit of a different name and it's called On the Journey with Carissa and Friends. And so the first thing I want to tell you about is On the Journey. So um, a little bit behind the background as to the origin of On the Journey, and it's going to be a little bit of a rabbit trail, but bear with me because my journey of faith has been around for a long time, about nine years ago, um, it started with just a hub for blogs, basically. And we had several different contributed, contributors. Jill McSheehy is a dear friend of ours who was an original contributor, and she also has her own podcast as well. I encourage you to look up Jill McSheehy's podcast, and I'm, I'm going to try to link it in the descriptions as well. But it was a hub for different blogs. And so at its core, it was a platform for women to be able to come together and share their journeys of faith in order to encourage others through their experiences. It was a place that centralized in the idea that women are valuable. Women have a purpose in the kingdom of God. Women have a place and a calling in the kingdom of God. And that even if we are in the trenches of other of another vocation or if we're in the trenches as a stay at home mom or if we're just trying to figure out this thing called faith we can encourage each other we are not alone there is always someone else as first peter 5 tells us that is suffering um, many trials that we also are suffering there are brothers and sisters out there that are suffering the very same kinds of things that we are going through and so never really when we're in a family as big as the kingdom of god are we truly alone and so at its essence my journey of faith is a place to offer community and unity and a platform for women who want to share who want to reach out to others who want to use their lives to glorify God or who has a specific call in ministry that they are passionate about and so that's where it all began and so from there I was able to get involved with 
um, the online magazine that My Journey of Faith has. I was able to have a blogging platform where I could share my own stories, but also I could make sure and share women's stories as well and just really use it as a way to encourage other people through the stories of women. And so that's grown in areas of where now we should have devotionals, Writers, women come and they share devotionals every morning. We continue with the magazine. We're in the process of building Bible studies online so that women, once again, women who cannot get to a Bible study or maybe there's not one at that time, um, it can feel so isolating to do life and to try to work out our faith alone. And so we want to reach out and reach women right where you are and make it convenient and easy to um, interact with the community of faith and a community of spiritually minded, um, Jesus loving women. So that's the core of my journey of faith. And as I personally have grown in my own walk and in my own journey, it's been a lonely one at times. It's been a, it hasn't been the one that I saw in church. If I can be really transparent. Um, I'm a counselor by trade and I love, love at the core of who I am digging into what makes people work. Um, we are never really who we present on the surface. Most of the time we usually need to peel back layers and look past, um, circumstances that present themselves to find out what's really going on in someone's story. And it takes a lot of life and a lot of experiences to build us into the people that we are today. And so as a counselor, I've always seen the value in digging into story, um, that, that it really is beautiful and precious. The events that have happened and compiled together to craft who we are as people and our journeys of faith are no different. And so for me, my journey began a long time ago. Um, I was saved when I was a young child, when I was about eight years old. And I come from a pastor's family. My dad was a preacher. My grandfather was a preacher. Several of my uncles are pastors. Um, I'm very much a legacy preacher's kid. And with that, even though I do have a deeply rooted grounding in church and in church life and in faith in general, there also comes with that almost a prerequisite that you are fine. And what I mean by that is we become very good at being good all the time at presenting ourselves as being fine, as being um, okay. So for my particular family, and I, I don't want to speak for my mom, but I believe that um, she came by this pretty honestly. Our goal in life was to really be the model for the people that were a part of the congregation. And so we were the good church family. We smiled all the time. We made people feel welcome. If we were having a hard day, you can bank that nobody knew it. Um, we would sit in our church pew and we would sit together and we would sit quietly and we would smile. And as children, we would speak when spoken to. And we were very, very good at keeping up a, a front of fine. And over time, it became a skill for me to be what I now call um, a very great pretender. And what a lot of people didn't realize is that as we were sitting smiling on the front row of our church pew, our home life looked very different. Um, much of my childhood was uh, saturated with legalism, with uh, some violence, some domestic violence at home. And my own father's faith journey is one that was very incredible as I look back on it and think back on it because he grew from a place of legalism and just really didn't fully understand and grasp grace. Um, it took him really losing everything and hitting rock bottom to truly see the light of grace shining in his own life. And he met Jesus in an incredible and profound way and was transformed from someone who was trapped in a, what I believe to be a pit of self struggle and legalism and unreasonable expectations and just not understanding the grace of Jesus as he tried to earn this place of perfection in his mind to being a man who truly modeled redemption and forgiveness 
and grace, the picture of grace for Jesus. And when my father died, um, my junior year of school, um, the journey that I embarked on of really being a prodigal, uh, went off the deep end. And so I had spent some of my childhood life before and after my parents split up, um, really trying to be that, that fine person, that, that person who was together all the time. It was good. Who was happy, who perfected everything I could do, who went into circumstances and situations and tried to make them okay. Um, I tried to be the, the perfect student at school. I tried to be the person that people like to be around. I tried to be the one who had a lot of friends and who would come in and and be inviting and make people happy all the time. And, and it was really hard and really exhausting. And so even though I loved Jesus and had given my heart to Jesus at a very young age, I did not understand grace at all. I was terrified of God because the only picture I had gotten of God up till that point was one who was full of wrath And he really had his arms crossed and just sat back and was kind of waiting on me to disappoint him. Uh, I would come to find out later that was very much not the character of God. But as a kid, that's really who I pictured in my mind. And I grew up thinking if I could only, um, if I could only be good, if I could only be pleasing, if I could only be perfect, then I would be loved and I would be approved of, and I would be accepted, and everything would be okay. I would be safe, and I would be well. And as I grew older and um, lived in a a home uh, that was, you know, had a single mom who worked really hard to make ends meet and to keep food on our table and to keep us okay. Um, And then I went into childhood years and, and teenage years, childhood turned into teenage years, and I realized that not only would I never be perfect, Um, I failed at it continually. Um, Shame became another brand new theme that stayed with me from an early adolescent age until into my adult age. And so shame would become the grounding force that would drive my poor decisions, my running from God, my attempt to escape spiritual um, immaturity and misunderstanding. And it would continue to follow me into my early adult years when, unfortunately, I would just choose to kind of give up altogether. I hid a lot behind the masks that I had created to survive, the ones that I had created to um, present a perfect front, a front of somebody who had it all together, of somebody who was happy, of somebody who had a good life. When inside, I was sad, when I was lonely. And I felt um, unknown, and I felt unvaluable, and I felt unloved. And so as I grew and went to college in my young adult years, I started to see other people around me and wonder, do they feel this way too? Are they struggling? Are they hurting? Do they feel invisible? Do they feel fake? Do they know who they are, or do they struggle to find who they are like I do? And I met my husband when I was 18 years old, and for the first time, someone actually saw me, and someone gave me permission to not only find out who I truly was, but to actually come to like that person. And as I went to college, I um, got my undergraduate degree in psychology and went on to graduate school in, in clinical social work. And I got about the business of finding myself because when hurt people try to help people, it's detrimental because we all know hurt people really only hurt people. And so I was hurting. I was grieving. I was insecure. I was isolated. I was confused. And at the core of all of these things, I had a lot of doubts, not about who God is, but about whether or not God loves me, whether or not God wanted me, and whether or not God God truly forgave me for the sin that was so plentiful in my life. And so as I got about the business of figuring out how to heal and how to recover and how to be restored, I felt kind of tugging for God to pull me as God was pulling me back to himself. 
and I got my degree and became a professional counselor and my husband, my wonderful husband and I got married and, um, and we started living a married life and throughout the, our early adult married lives, um, I watched as God pull my husband back to him as well. I saw my husband accept Christ as his personal savior and it was just a time of restoration for us and, um, a time of, growing together, making some serious decisions about what kind of marriage we wanted to have and who we really wanted to be as people individually and together. And I started to get serious about seeking God again. And through that process, um, my first of three children would be born, my oldest daughter. And I had to decide I'm either going to be in this thing called faith I'm going to be in this. I'm going to figure out who I am and who God is. So not only who I am as a person, because I'd done a lot of work and I'd done a lot of healing and I'd done a lot of recovery, but I hadn't done it on a spiritual level. Most of it was done um, in a secular way. And so it was time for me to bring God into my life and really face him. And it was scary, but at the same time, I was not turning back. I was seeking him. It was time. I was going to be a mom. And other people now were at the mercy of my own spiritual health. And so I started going to Bible study at my local church. And this was a turning point for me because throughout um, being a counselor, I was able to dig into uh, stories of women who were struggling and even teenagers who were struggling as I worked with families and with children. Um, and I started to see patterns of women who really felt disconnected, women who felt lonely, women who felt not enough or felt like they were ever doing things well enough. There was a, a pattern of women seeking other women for validation in a way that was turning into comparison and competition instead of um, bonding and unity and mutual encouragement. And I wondered if that was the case in the spiritual community as well. And as I started seeing what it was like being a part of a body of faith, a Bible study of women who were really transparent and honest, I started to look at that and compare it with a world outside of women and friends that I had that were not connecting on that deep spiritual heart level that were just trying to make friendships and create lives based on what they could bring to the table the best that they could. Um, they were missing a heart for God. They were missing what Nehemiah says. Um, I'm reading Kelly Minter's Nehemiah study right now and what she calls a heart that can break. And I didn't want to be that anymore. I wanted to be real. I wanted for people to know me. I wanted for Jesus to know me. I didn't want to hide behind masks anymore. I wanted the God that was scary to become who is now, I can proudly say, my good father. I needed that at the core of who I was. I needed to know that Jesus accepted me. Broken, ugly, messy, all of it. And I realized that everything from the time I was eight years old until the time that I sat at that table at my first women's Bible study, it was all a journey. It was all a process that I was on, a, a journey of faith that had brought me to that point and that time to make some decisions about who God was going to be to me. What was I going to do? How was I going to grow? How was I going to invest in this journey of faith. And for the first time, really ever, I felt like I wasn't alone. And so that started my research and my desire to know God more. And for my own personal study, um, I did some women's studies. I did um, some some studies that had already been written, some different curriculum, but I wanted to dig in for myself. And so I started digging into the book of Hebrews. And if you're looking for a book that will rock your world, but will also give you a big picture of who God is in whole, and that's what I needed. I needed a whole picture of God because my fragmented pictures was not telling me the whole story. And so a great book to look at that will give you a good, solid knowledge of Old Testament truths combined with where Jesus kind of takes over and fills in all the gaps and fulfills all the promises made in the Old Testament and gives you a whole picture 
um, Hebrews is the place to go. It's a challenging book, but it's so good. And it was transforming for me. And I read Hebrews. And so I want to read Hebrews three through four, because in not the full, but just to let you know some of the truths that reached out to me as I was trying to battle through, God, do you love me for who I am? And if you do, why do I continually feel this burden of shame that I can't get off my shoulders? And in Hebrews 3 through 4, the writer tells us that the main goal of a peaceful and restored spiritual journey is in order for us to really rest talks a lot about rest, which I needed because I was burdened and I was exhausted. And Jesus says, come to me who all, all of you who are burdened and I will give you rest. And I thought, why can't I get there? Why can't I get that? And so for us to find rest, it's not our behaviors. It's not doing all the right things. It's not getting it all perfect as I, as I had been taught and really had convinced myself. It wasn't presenting the best me. It was belief. At some point, I was going to have to trust that when Jesus says, my grace is sufficient for you, when Jesus says, I'm here to give you rest, I'm dying once and for all so that you don't have to to die for your sin that you deserve to die for. I'm doing it for you. When Jesus says all these things and does all these things, he means it. That we really do have a high priest who died once and for all for our sins, as Hebrews as Hebrews nine twenty five through twenty eight says. For Jesus didn't enter again and again, the way that the high priest did year after year for our sin atonement in the temple. He didn't he didn't enter into death again and again and again. He didn't go on the cross again and again and again for our atonement like they did in the Old Testament. Because then he would have to have suffered again and again since the foundation of the world. But he did once. He died once, chapter 9 says, to offer up himself to bear the sins of many. He died once for all, for our sins to be forgiven. Once. Every time I was doubting him, every time I didn't believe that his grace was enough for me, every time I would go to him in shame and just beg to be forgiven and for him to take me back and to accept me and and um, re- get, rededicate my life, really those were all acts of unbelief. The shame that I was carrying around was shame of unbelief. That's why I wasn't resting in him. And so I made the decision for myself that I believed him that I believed him, that I would never be perfect, that he was the only perfect person, that I would never fully achieve that level of um, glory that he had achieved, that I was going to make mistakes, that I was going to mess up, that I would still have sin patterns that I would struggle to overcome because at the core of who I am, those things are going to have to be rooted out over time. I am on a journey And Jesus is not only okay with that, but he is on this journey with me. He's not going to let me do this alone, but he is walking step by step beside me. And as Hebrews says that I have him sitting on the throne in heaven as my high priest so that I can continually daily, preferably and when necessary, come before his throne for grace upon grace upon grace when I need it. I'm never, ever on the journey alone. He is always with me. And for me to understand that as a person who had been not only early on struggling and fighting for perfection, but then continually feeling like a failure because I couldn't ever achieve it. I was always messing up. I was always making mistakes. I was always having to go back in tears and say, Jesus, I'm sorry. Will you take me back again? Will you let me try again? Don't let this be the time that you give up on me. And I just carried that burden of fear and shame and failure with me. For me to see this in black and white and really have it penetrate my heart was one of, it was the most freeing experience for me. I was able to choose to trust him with my whole self and my whole heart and fully open up to him. There wasn't going to be any more running and hiding. I was still going to struggle. I would still um, fall back into old patterns but I could get back up and I could start over again and I could go to the throne and say, okay, Jesus, I need more mercy and I need more grace and I'm ready to start over again. I'm ready to keep going on the journey. 
and move through the process towards the end goal, which is your final kingdom of heaven. That perspective is one that can change the course of how we do this thing called faith. And this podcast is meant to give you not only examples of this, of of different journeys, the way different journeys look and the way that different processes of faith look, but to tell you, keep going. Don't give in to shame or guilt or sin patterns. Don't give in to unbelief that Jesus is there with you in those darkest places, in those places of loss, of grief, of confusion, of suffering. You are never, ever alone there. He is always with you. And even when we don't see exactly why things are happening the way they are, when we, if we keep going and if we hold on to each other in the process, to our friends in the process, we can do this thing together. We can get to the other side and we can look back and see, okay, this was hard but I have overcome this. Jesus has brought me through this. My, my, I have friends. I have other brothers and sisters who are experiencing these trials of the same kind. I do have a God of all comforts who can comfort me in the times that I need it. And I can be used for God's glory and to help encourage somebody else who may be going through the same situations that I'm going through. My hope is that you're going to be encouraged as you listen to this podcast by my story and also by the stories that you hear from other women. And my hope also is that we can give you tangible truths because where we're going from here is to take our stories and our community and our unity and try to coach you through how to take steps to either get through what you're going through right now so that you got tangible application, so that you have real resources and real tools where we're not going to leave you, oh great, we know you're here, good luck with that, but we're going to give you ways to process through things, to process through divorce, to process through parenting, to process through singleness, to process through learning God's word. Man, that's frustrating when you're starting out as um, maybe a new believer or somebody who isn't biblically just well-versed and you feel frustrated because you want to know it all. I know I wanted to know it all right now. I ended up in seminary because I couldn't wait. I had to know everything I could know. And so I want to give you tangible examples through my friends and through my own input on how you can become more well-versed in your Bible. Maybe you're struggling in your prayer life. Maybe you're struggling in your um, thought life. Maybe you're struggling with determining what call that you know God has placed a call in your life, but you can't quite figure out what that is or what that looks like for you or how it can play out. We're going to talk ministry. We're going to talk Enneagram, which is one of my favorite topics. We're going to talk Bible study. We're going to talk all things marriage, love, spirit, mind, soul. We're going to talk depression and anxiety. Um, I'm going to tell you honest parts of my own journey that um, I know a lot of you will be able to relate to. And so I just hope you come back and you spend time with us as um, as we process through all these things together and work through all of these things together so that ultimately you know you're not alone. You are um, with a family of friends, a group of friends that you're going to come to know as familiar voices and familiar names who are right here walking beside you to really accompany you as we battle through together on this journey of faith. Be blessed today and encourage one another daily as long as it's called today because friends, all we have is each other on this journey together.